everybody. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, introduce you to Quera Computing. I, I think I have been very blessed with a very good segue, uh, not only by our friends from Adam Computing, who just uh, introduced you all, all the basic concepts of the technology, but also by our friends from AWS. Helmut, I believe, earlier today was uh, talking a lot about the applications that people have been doing with our technology and our systems. So this means that I can focus on the pleasant side, which is just talk about vision and the future and the leadership on this uh, technology. And uh, I, my slides disappeared, and I hope they will come back. Here they are. So uh, since many of you might not know us yet, uh, I'll start with uh, telling you who is Quera. So we are a quantum computing based uh, company. Uh, we make hardware, but we are actually building the full stack software algorithms as well, solutions based in Boston. Our scientific foundations come from Harvard and MIT, uh, where the uh, early technology of uh, neutral atom uh, has been developed from the beginning. And uh, uh, by now, we are about 50 scientists and uh, engineers and physicists and uh, 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 computer scientists really uh, working on taking this technology, making the best possible uh, machines that we can, and commercializing them, bringing them to bear on solutions to our customers and uh, for researchers as well. So, so that you can grasp a little bit of uh, how fast the development of neutral atom technology has been, I prepared a little bit of a timeline to, uh, to give you a feeling. So back in 2015, that, what you're seeing, is an optical table. You've, if you have never seen an optical table, that's what it looks like. It has a, little, a bunch of little holes where you can put your mirrors. And this was in the uh, lab of uh, one of our scientific founders, Michel looking at Harvard. In two, two years, we were already holding, uh, the Harvard team at least was holding, a uh, world record, record of 51 atoms, which evolved into a lot of scientific breakthrough, so much that that was warranting the foundation, the, the spin-off of a company, that's Quera, that's us. In two more years, uh, what we had was two amazing uh, years of uh, breakthrough, both on demonstration of optimization and simulation results, but as well as demonstrating a new architecture called qubit shuttling that is the architecture that we believe will lead us to fault tolerance and error correction and uh, you know, the machines that we have been looking for uh, ahead of uh, uh, everyone. Finally, on that same year, we put out our own first quantum computer on the cloud. So for the past 10 months, we remain to date the only neutral atom quantum computing company to have a publicly accessible machine on the cloud. This is deployed on AWS. Any of you can access it. It's public, but it's not free. <laughs> so uh, you can access it. It's not expensive to use it. And uh, um, we have been seeing this year really a huge lineup of service of users. Users include BMW, who has already a paper on it. Uh, it includes also friends from uh, Fujifilm here in Japan. And uh, uh, tied together with that, we have demonstrated the industry standard of best possible two qubit gates with 99.5% fidelity. These are results coming from our sister team at Harvard that fit directly into our own pipeline for development. So, so that you understand, well, let me leave one message here. 2015, zero. 2021, product. Okay, so within six to seven years, we had an empty optical table to a product on the cloud and customers using it. So this is extremely, extremely fast from the perspective of bringing technology out of university and into commercialization. How do we achieve that? We achieve that by revising how we approach, how you challenge quantum computing, well, classical computing with quantum computers. So there is a, a little bit of a, 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 a diagram here. It's just my, our mindset. Again, this is not to judge anyone. It has no uh, numbers anywhere. It's just how we think about how we should build computers that make a difference. So, Everybody wants something that lies together in that uh, purple star, right? So fault-tolerant, universal, large quantum computers. But what we see is that the majority of the industry is following a path that is like this. You take, you build a machine with uh, one, two, ten qubits, all universal, but uh, you start to multiply that and multiply that. And what we see is that this process is actually quite slow. It's slow because if you plan for making a machine that uh, develops control over 10 qubits, that does not necessarily work for 200 qubits. 
What we are proposing to do to ourselves, and that's how we have been moving, is to create a machine that solves problems at scale and deliver layers of programmability on top of this machine that is already at scale. This way we are not surprised by a solution that's worked in our previous you know, generation, but doesn't work in the newer one. So this is the way that we believe that we should be building quantum computers, and that's how we have been approaching this problem. So what we choose is neutral atom quantum processors. We just had a very in-depth analysis of what that means. I will leave you with the main important point is that this is a new way to think about scalable quantum computing. That's what neutral atoms represent in the industry today. A little bit of an advertisement of our own machine. So we have a machine, 256 qubits is actually the largest publicly accessible quantum computer today uh, on Amazon. So this machine has coherence throughout the, uh, the calculation time that our users have. It works in something that we call the analog mode. I'm going to tell you a little bit more of what that is. And it follows an architecture that we call a field programmable qubit array, an FPQA. That is sort of an analog of FPGAs that you might have used uh, if you are familiar with embedded systems engineering. Again, these machines are available on AWS. And what do we mean by analog computing? Right? So, Usually, when you think about quantum computing, you might have been used so far to this picture on the left, where you see a lot of gates and uh, co you know, coordinations and, and commands that you give uh, uh, to your machine before you measure it. On the right, what you see is that all those little boxes can actually be condensed on a single big box, one big box that controls all qubits at once. And the bottom line of this story is that while the case on the left is universal, it's not efficient. Okay, so that's what leads to all the noise and uh, an, an extra expense of uh, quantum resources that is a rare commodity today. Okay, machines, they decohere very fast. So you need to use these things efficiently. The case on the right, uh, if you assume that every little box leads to errors in the beginning and in the end, this becomes something that really reduces the amount of noise, the amount of errors that you apply whenever you're de deploying a gate. But it also allows you to do things like quantum simulation without strutterization, which is like, amazing to my perspective, because it's really, really efficient. The problem is that it's not universal. If it were universal, we would be in an amazing place, but it's very hard to make this universal. You have to control this in a very general way to make it universal, and it's very hard to do that. So what do we do to compensate the fact that it's not universal? We rely on the fact that atoms live in free space. So what you're seeing there, every little purple pink dot is one individual atom. And these atoms can be repositioned in free space by the user. So you can see a square lattice here. This is what's called a Kagome lattice. This, well, you should know, this is just the coast of uh, the world line, coast of uh, our own planet. And we can really do whatever we want with these atoms, okay? And uh, this is, might look like just a, a, a curiosity, but actually this is the beginning of a fault-tolerant quantum computer, and I'm going to explain to you why. But while we don't get there, this also allows you to do something very interesting, which is to create machines that allow you to create useful solutions today, and in particular lead to discovery today. So what are the problems that we solve efficiently? Well, they include the holy trinity of machine learning optimization and simulation, which is what I guess everybody in the industry uh, thinks about. Uh, on machine learning, we work with an interesting method of reservoir computing, which is uh, gradient-free and therefore trainable, and uh, uh, trainable at a quantum level. And that can, is amenable to classification of uh, uh, not only digits, but also not only binary classification, but uh, you know, like even 10 digits, and that's something that is quite remarkable, I believe, as well. Optimization, uh, we focus on a type of problem that's called the maximum independent set. This maximum independent set has several, several applications from star placement to antenna placement to mission planning of uh, you know, scheduling satellites. But all of these problems, they are NP-complete, NP-hard, depends a little bit on how you ask the question. And this means that from there, we can also address Kubo type of problems, graph coloring, and, and others. And finally, simulation. While it's very hard to do simulation of chemistry, like fermionic electronic chemistry, these machines are very interesting for simulating NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance type of uh, systems, and also many other applications that are very exciting for physicists, if uh, not for everybody, like lattice gauge theory, high energy physics, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, 
a little example of what you can do with uh, this capacity to move atoms to redefine the position of uh, your qubits. So here, what you're looking at is Manhattan. If you've never seen Manhattan, that's what it looks like. And maybe you want to try to uh, place some uh, combini, right, like a 7-Eleven in Manhattan. So you can put, imagine, like the positions where you would place your stars. If you place the stars too close, you would expect them to compete. If you place them too far apart, you're not covering your audience. So what you can do to try to figure out what's the best place to position uh, those stars is to create atomic Manhattan. Right? <laughs> this is, yeah, that's what it looks like um, in our system. And you can drive these atoms to do a calculation and to figure out exactly what's the position of the, the, the stars that you wanted to place. And this is interesting because it allows you to leverage the geometry of your system into the geometry of your quantum hardware and make that solution better or faster or more likely to get you the exact solution that you're looking for your problem. So that's why we're calling this an FPQA, right? An FPGA is a, is a system that you can reprogram the connectivity of your, uh, your, of your transistors so that you, lead, you end up with a application-specific, uh, uh, you know, efficient uh, circuit. And what this does is the same, but with qubits. Now, is that also just a curiosity, or can we do something better with that? Actually, we can do something better with that. So, Scalability, as we have just discussed, is something that is very accessible to neutral atoms. This is a picture from a friend of ours, uh, Hannes Bernian, group at uh, uh, U of Chicago, and shows you that within one objective camera, we can fit 10,000 atoms. So this is not, a, this is not like a, a, a space for 100 or, 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 or 200, right? So this is 10,000 qubits that can fit inside a single system without interconnection. And the energy consumption of this is actually quite favorable, order 10,000 uh, um, uh, watts, which is, uh, I guess we can agree, a, a small fraction of what an HPC center would consume. Playing with this ability to move atoms and place them wherever you want, we can do something more interesting even, which is to create multiple zones. So if you look at your own laptop in front of you, perhaps, or maybe not, uh, what you see is that you don't have a control channel for every transistor that your laptop has. There is such a thing called an information bus. There are memory zones, there are processing zones. Because if you had to control every single transistor with an individual cable, that's the same thing as thinking of changing the channel of your high-def TV with a controller that has one button per pixel. That's very hard. That's not something that you'll be changing channel uh, anytime soon. So you better just start with the, the channel that you like. Uh, so by doing this, what we can have is an area where we have uh, qubits, where we can just place them and use them, uh, the long-term, uh, long, long uh, time memory, that long time coherence that they have to keep a memory, and move these atoms into a processing area one by one or groups by groups to measure them in parallel and to operate on them in parallel without scaling the number of controls per qubit. So this is a really simplified control budget. It's few lasers to many qubits. So if we take seven to 10 lasers to control 200 qubits, we are gonna take seven to 10 lasers to control 1,000, seven to 10 lasers to control a million. Well, a million is gonna be hard to fit, but 10,000, it's not so hard. Uh, this also means a simplified algorithmic budget and all-to-all -all connectivity. In particular, we believe that because of this ability to reconnect and redefine the position of the atoms, this is the technology that is gonna allow for empirical tests of error correction. So this means that you don't have to plan error correction, design your chip, and wait for it to be fabricated, only to figure out that your decision for error correction architecture does not work. Here, you can test empirically. And even though we have many theorists in the company, including myself, we are very, very serious about being held accountable by nature and really by testing, like an experimentalist mindset. We have, if you want to do a quantum computing that works, you have to build something and you have to test and you have to verify that it works. It's not enough to just plan ahead. So that's it. This is our quantum roadmap. Uh, I can tell you what the roadmap is. We cannot tell you how much, how fast we are driving, but uh, uh, the idea is to give you machines that can bring you value today, that you can learn something from them today, and learn how this technology will advance into optimal NISC controls, optimal 
control budget for the amount of gates and the amount of uh, controls and, 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 uh, and algorithms that you want to do, and the complexity of the algorithms that you want to do, and to do fault tolerance as soon as possible using a architecture that actually looks like a computer, that is not just a, you know, the repetition of many copies of what you started from a single small um, original uh, uh, QPU. So how do you work with Quera? I think that this is an important point. We, as a, uh, a full-stack company, we are doing solutions, we are doing premium access, and we are doing machine sales. So we have world-class experts in how to make these machines perform best for your, uh, for your services, for your needs, and uh, we are here to help you develop those algorithms, and we already have many uh, clients and partners, friends here in Japan, we also offer premium access because sometimes the amount of machine time that you can get on the public access is not enough. You like it so much that you really want to use more and we can provide you with extra access because as I said, these machines are real, they are public, you can access them, we have them. And finally, we have been also discussing machine sales. There are groups that are interested. So you, you should see this as an evolution, right? You start by learning how to use it. You get premium access because you're needing it. But if you need it very much, we are really here thinking about how to sell you those machines and how to create a manufacturing pipeline that will allow us to deliver these machines uh, in a timely and uh, uh, valuable way for you. So how do you get started with us? First of all, connect with me. Uh, you can look for me on LinkedIn. I don't have a, 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 a link over there for that, but it's easy to find me. Or write me an email. Uh, check Blockade. Blockade is our software. It uh, works both as an emulator and as an SDK for uh, Aquila, our machine. So you can submit jobs to AWS from Blockade, but you can also do simulations on your HPC clusters. You can deploy blockade on EC2 instances on AWS if you are using AWS. So blockade is really amazing. It works with GPUs, it works with HPC, multi-threading, cooks, dries, does everything for you. It's, I love blockade. And I also, I teach blockade, so if you're interested in learning how to use it, uh, do contact me about that as well. And finally, access our systems on AWS. That's the best way, you know, you test it, you use it, you f see how you feel about it reach back to us, tell us what you don't like about it. Right? Tell us what you like about it as well. We'll be happy about it, but tell us what you don't like because this is important so that this service provides you with what you need. And if you happen to work with uh, academic institutions, it's possible to get uh, research credits, so for free. So reach me out about that. And that's what I have to say. I would like to save some time for questions. So, Thank you very much. Uh, arigatou gozaimashita.